to my bedside, Lieutenant. The Marine Corps Code of Conduct and the King James Bible. I hate snakes, Doc! I hate them! And may the Christian Lord guide my hand against your Roman popery! And they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! We're on a mission from God. I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby Land, where maybe we can find some self confidence for you, you jack wagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. Yeah, here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker right here, Area 52. This is Pastor Mike and I'm online and I'm live with you today. Good to be with you. I'm going to start out with a uh, public service announcement. Um, we have, uh, followers that live in Indiana and, um, in Indiana, there is a, or somewhere there's a killer, uh, on the loose and, um, very, very dangerous, evil man. And, um, I don't know these two young ladies. I never met them. I went to the place where they were slaughtered and it just it sends chills up and down your spine uh this is abby williams and liberty german 13 and 14 years old they were best of friends besties and they were at a uh, public park i mean it's a neat place i hate the fact that these girls were killed there because it just it dirties the place it's what it does there's there's blood spilled on the ground there and uh uh it just it you know that's what's in your mind instead of the beauty of this park uh right outside of delphi indiana and um there is an audio recording of this man recorded from uh one of the girls cell phones uh they i guess i think the story is they knew something was up and they were able to capture uh just a brief segment of his voice and here is his picture because this guy was stalking them and um then he eventually caught up to him and uh raped him and killed him and um there is a 200 and 240,000 reasons why uh he needs to be caught because that's the reward but the reward the greater reward is in knowing that you helped uh capture somebody that um he has done this it's possible he's done it before, and it's highly likely that he will do it again. If this guy rings a bell uh, to you, <coughs> there you go. If this guy rings a bell, if he looks familiar, if you are this guy, turn yourself in, and um, I hope and pray that this man has um a a prison ministry uh once he gets to prison and he lives long enough to be saved um as they put him on death row uh because that's according to God's law that's what should be done with this man and so pray for these families they've been dealing with this uh since um what year was this it was was yeah was this um 20 yeah 2017 this this year <clears throat> i was thinking it was l- longer ago than that but 
Anyway, if you have any information on this creep, um, call somebody in law enforcement, and uh, I'm sure they will get you to the right place. The phone number for the tip line is 844-459-5786, or you may send an email to Abby and Libby Tip at C-A-C-O-S-H-R-F uh, dot com. That's the sheriff's uh, number. So if you send something stupid, you know, like sometimes people send me stupid emails, um, you're sending it to the sheriff's office, and I think I would be careful with that. All right? Anyway, good to be with you today. And um, I want to read a verse of uh, Scripture to you just as soon as I find it. I've got a couple stories uh, to share with you today. And uh, Psalm 68, 17 is where we're going to go. But I've got a couple stories to share with you today that uh, just popped up today, two or three, about unidentified flying objects. One of them uh, has to do with um, alien biological entity that was seen hovering over Canada. Um, the video, uh, even though it's shaky, is very interesting. Um, and if it's a hoax, it's a really good one. Uh, but it it's the video is very, very interesting. And um, I, I, I believe in alien biological entities. I believe in flying objects that are not of this world world that's that's what i believe do i believe uh the, do i believe project blue book i don't know uh probably i'm like j allen hynek some of them are just totally unbelievable some of the stories have some sort of natural explanation to them but hynek started out as a um uh, he was a he was a, a scientist i think a physicist and he was a skeptic of the UFO phenomenon, and the uh, Air Force hired him to run Project Blue Book, which was they're going to investigate all of these alien UFO sightings. And when he did his investigation and submitted Project Blue Book uh, back to the Air Force, uh, he was convinced that there was enough encounters with these aliens with these UFOs, um, there was no natural explanation. There was um, nothing, um, th there was no earthly explanation for what it was that these people had seen, and he believed them. He thought their stories were credible, and he believed them. Uh, he is the one that um, came up with, <clears throat> excuse me, the classification of alien encounters. Uh, you had a close encounter of a first kind, which was you saw a an unidentified flying object in the sky, and um, your story is credible. Close encounters of a second kind is that you saw an alien ship uh, on the on the surface of the Earth. Um, and then a close encounter of the third kind was you saw an alien biological entity. You saw an inhabitant of that particular vehicle. And um, it was from that that Steven Spielberg created his movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And he actually featured uh, a very short cameo appearance by J. Allen Hynek when the... Um, when the alien ships start showing up, Heineck comes out and strokes his goatee beard and sticks his pipe uh, in his mouth as he's looking at the mothership, and, th and then that's all you see. Um, but he started out as a skeptic, and then he was a believer. I am a believer in to the extent that I believe that there are credible encounters with these vehicles, is what I'll call them, and I also believe there are credible encounters with alien biological entities 
of a celestial nature. Okay, I'm trying to use my my words here, my language, very carefully. Uh, and here's why. The Bible says in Psalm 68, 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. So what we have, and we're going we're gonna to visit um, Ezekiel chapter 1. We'll get to it about an hour or so from now. Um, but we're going to talk about we're going to talk about uh, some of these UFOs, what they are. We're going to get it, and we're going to, and just sort of mash together, we're going to get an understanding of, I was talking last week about quantum computers and how it is that they work, what it is that they're tapping into, and so forth. And we're going to do this by way of getting an understanding of, from the word of God concerning a higher dimension than the one that you and I exist in right now. The, the higher realm, the spiritual realm, a different direction that right now we can't point towards. We can't, I cannot tell you where the fourth direction is. The Bible does, but I can't tell you that. Now, I'll explain that as we go along, but we're going to talk about the fourth dimension today and try to get a, an understanding from the Bible what it is because it's relevant not only with these alien biological entities, but it's relevant in understanding the quantum future because our future on this, on this earth, on this planet, our future involves an encounter with citizens, subjects, creatures, whatever you want to call them, of the fourth dimension, of a higher dimension, a higher plane, a higher level, um, whatever people in the earth call it. There is in the future of mankind an, a coming encounter with I think the Bible refers to them as aliens. That's what I think. Where do I get that? I'll, sh I'll share that with you in a minute. Um, this story came from um, our friend Smithy, who sent me this. Half of humanity believes in aliens. Uh, the article at Yahoo News says nearly half of humans believe in alien life and want to make contact. Dun, dun, dun. A survey in 24 countries has found in what researchers said helps to explain the lasting popularity of Star Wars franchise 40 years after the first movie was screened. On the eve of the release of The Last Jedi, researchers published findings that 47% of more than 26,000 respondents believe, quote, in the existence of intelligent alien civilizations in the universe. And even greater, 61% said yes when asked if they believe in some form of life on other planets. So you have more than a majority that believes that there is life on some other world somewhere in the universe. Among those who believe we are not alone, in the universe, 60% said we should try to seek contact with alien civilizations uh, it found. Or in other words, the survey found. It was not the first survey to collect views on extra extraterrestrial beings. Questionnaires in Germany, Britain, the United States have found similar rates, but researchers said this was the largest poll of its kind with such global reach. Um, research director Martin Lampert said... The high score on the belief in the existence of intelligent alien civilizations and the distinct profile of these people partly explains the immense popularity of space movies such as Star Wars. People who believe in the existence of intelligent alien civilizations are not a marginal 
minority. Where is the kaboom? There was supposed to be an earth-shattering kaboom. Uh, let's see here. I didn't read that article. Where's the other one? Ah! Now, here is another one. Another story. This was on uh, Drudge Report. Astronomers scan an alien comet. Uh, let's see if I can pronounce this. The name for the uh, alien comet is Umau Mau. I'm not listen. I'm not making that up. Umau Mau. Uh, astronomers scan alien comet Umau Mau for ET signals. Astronomers are set to scan an alien comet for signs of extraterrestrial technology. The cigar-shaped asteroid named Umau Mau. By its discoverer, sailed past Earth last month and is the first interstellar object seen in the solar system. A team of alien hunting scientists, led by Russian billionaire Yuri Milner, will scan the comet this week before it sails beyond the reach of Earth's telescopes. They say they are looking for radio signals. Now, why do we think? Why do we think that this advanced species of alien biological entities with the technology to be able to travel all the way through the galaxy, all the way through the universe from their star, their planet, opening up a wormhole in space, diving through it, getting up to warp speed, warping space so they can travel through it faster than light itself. They have these advanced technological machines, these flying ships that they fly in, with technology that is far beyond our own, why is it that we always think that they must be playing a radio? Ridiculous. So they're looking for radio signals. Claiming the mysterious visitor could be an alien spaceship. They're And they're dead serious about it. Here is... Um, here is that comet, cigar-shaped comet. Um, let's see here. Then there was another one. There was, let me get to this, um, this uh, visitor here. Where is that, where is that story? Where is it? Come on, let me find it. I don't have it. I don't have it. Where is it? Didn't print out. There, I want to see if I can find it in my, here it is, my Evernotes. Here we go. Uh, let me put this on the screen for you here. Um, it doesn't quite have all the graphics, but take a look at this ship. There it is right here. Here is a, now the video, if you watch this video, um, you'll see the video. The guy zoomed in on the, it was very far away, and the guy took a camera, a video camera, and zoomed in on it about four or five times. And, of course, you know, when you zoom in that far away, if you don't have a camera on a tripod, it tends to bounce around a little bit because you're covering a very, very, very small area in the sky. But this is some of the close-ups that people were able to capture from this particular video. Now, the story is this was a, a biological entity filmed over Quebec, Canada, this strange creature has a silver color and emits various shades of light. It also changes shape in a strange way. Um, and then the article says, please tell us what you think this is. Now, the guy that sent it to me uh, said, Pastor, you know, first thing we were thinking of was fiery flying serpents. And uh, I am, um, I, I would say it's very possible very very possible that you could be di if if let's just eliminate some things if this is not a hoax if it's not a hoax and this particular object in the sky does not have an earthly origin in other words um it's not elon musk and it's not jeff bezos trying to get to the um trying to get to Mars, 
Uh, and it's not Donald Trump sending NASA up because Trump says we need to go back to the moon again. Um, and for those of you who don't believe that, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and I'm going to try to touch on that today because uh, the flat earth people believe that there is this impenetrable shell over planet earth. Uh, nothing has ever penetrated it. And they conclude then that there has never been any rocket, any manned spaceship, or any, they do not believe that there are any satellites. Okay? They do not believe in, in satellite. They do not believe that Russia or the United States or China or Japan or Europe or Australia has ever, ever sent up a satellite, weather satellite, um, telecommunications satellite, um, what other kind? Spy satellites, nothing. There, according to the flat earth people, this dome up in the sky is impenetrable and there is no such thing as satellite television, satellite phones, weather satellites, um, Google satellites from Google Earth that take pictures of the earth. All of those things are, they're frauds. That's a fraud. You do not get your satellite TV transmission from an actual satellite. They say that you get it from a cell tower. That's, that's what they say. And the, the TV weatherman is not actually getting um, his, his um, graphics of the clouds and weather patterns and rain and things. They're not getting that from satellites. They're getting that from, uh, they, they either make it up with Photoshop or, or you know some sort of video montage software that where they just make this stuff up <clears throat> or it's a plane flying high in the altitude but it's there are no satellites anywhere uh the nsa does not have sp spy satellites um again the and and your gps system yeah uh-huh see uh, you uh, i beat you to it kevin um there are no gps satellites anywhere even though your your iPhone or your Samsung phone or your Google phone uh, or the little little GPS thing in your car is able to pinpoint your exact location to the to within about five to ten feet even though that people all over the world are using them according to them there are no GPS satellites anywhere and it's based on this false idea that there is an impenetrable dome over the earth and nothing can penetrate it. That is not true according to the scriptures. Let me read um, Obadiah. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me, let me read Amos chapter 9 first. Um, who was, whose idea was it? that mankind would eventually be able to reach into the heavens. It was God who said it first. It wasn't NASA, wasn't Werner von Braun, wasn't Adolf Hitler. It was God who said it. In Amos chapter 9, uh, the Bible says, It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven." And hath founded his troop in the earth, he that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Um, let's see here. Then it, then it goes into um, Obadiah, the book of Obadiah. <clears throat> here we have um, a prophecy concerning Edom or people of the tribe of Edom. Uh, the Bible says uh, in Obadiah verse 4, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, what was it, the first spaceship that landed on the moon? What was it called? I mean, God even named 
the spaceship that did it. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. And not only have we been into the heavens, or the, or the heaven, not only have we been there, but we still have a nest up there. It's called the International Space Station. And the, there are people who believe that as you watch hour upon hour of live video feed from the ISS, they want you to believe that these people are filming this on one of those vomit comets. That's what the NASA uh, astronauts called those jets. They would take them up high altitude and then make a nosedive straight down to simulate weightlessness. And they say that these people are shooting this video on these vomit comets. But the truth of it is, these vomit comets can only go down for about, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 seconds, something like that. I don't know. But it's not very long. And you watch these guys on the ISS, you know, doing their reports or whatever. They're 20, 30, sometimes an hour long they're doing this. Not only that, I have an app that tells me, I used to, used to listen to the weatherman. Uh, the weatherman would say the International Space Station is going to be flying over the St. Louis area. And if you live outside, you know, uh, the suburbs where you can see, you'll be able to see this thing at such and such time. And I would go out, and I've seen it on about two or three occasions, exactly when the weatherman told me. But now I've got an app on my iPhone that tells me different things that are happening in the heavens. And I get this alert saying ISS is the flyover is now. And I go outside and I've seen the ISS actually flying overhead. There's this light and it's moving very, very fast across the heavens. It takes a few minutes to get across. I've seen it with my own eyes. Anybody with a, with a halfway decent telescope can view this thing from the earth and actually see that it's not an airplane flying up there. It is the International Space Station. So don't write me any letters sending me, you know, a list of 40 YouTube videos to watch to prove that the earth is flat and nobody's ever gone into heavens. It was God's idea first. So if you don't believe what the Bible says, I can't help you. But God told Edom that they would be building, they would exalt themselves as the eagle. Tranquility Base here. The eagle has landed as the eagle and they would build a nest among the stars, and it's still there. The nest is still there. Thence God's going to bring them down. I don't know what he's going to do now, but God said he was going to bring them down. So you have two places in the Bible where God said that this was going to happen. Okay. So I believe that these entities exist and that there are flying vehicles in the heavens of a non-earthly basis. They are not from this earth. They are from, I don't believe they're from a different planet. I don't believe they're from Mars. I don't believe they're from Saturn. I don't believe they're from Sirius B, the dog star. I don't, I don't believe that. I believe that they are from a higher dimension than we are. So we're going to cover that today. We're going to, we're going to just kind of get the, the foundation of what the spiritual realm is all about. God allows us to see things in the Bible that our eyes cannot see. God does not leave us blind. And so he gives us everything that we need concerning what is in the spiritual, you can call it the spiritual realm, spiritual dimension, fourth dimension, um, higher dimension, a higher plane, a higher level. You can call it whatever you want, but the Bible refers to it as uh, with, with a certain term, and I'll show you what that term is in, uh, in a little bit. Let's go to the scriptures. Genesis chapter 1 is where we're going to start. Now, I want you to notice uh, God's, God's version of creating uh, the sun, moon, and the stars. This is what God said that he did, and again, for those of you who are atheists or those of you who believe you halfway believe the Bible, you believe there's a God, you believe Jesus Christ, 
but you don't believe in the literal application and interpretation of Genesis chapter 1, you say, well, you know, scientists has proven, you know, there's 13 and a half billion. No, scientists hasn't proven anything. Science has not ever proven that the universe is 13 and a half billion years old. They've never proven that. They've established that as a theoretical idea, but it's just that. It's a theory. But practically all of evolutionary science is built upon the fact that the earth and the universe must be billions of years old or else evolution the way they have it laid out doesn't work because you never have a rapid change of species or a rapid change from the earth going from this molten uh this big glob of molten mass to having flowers all over it that doesn't happen overnight it must happen over millions and millions and millions of years so they basically say evolution is true because the universe is 13 and a half billion years old and we know that the universe is 13 and a half billion years old because evolution's true it's a it's a concept that feeds on itself okay and i just don't believe it i believe what the bible says so we have uh, in the evening on the morning were the first day. So the Bible's telling you that it was in a standard run-of-the-mill 24-hour evening and morning day. The evening and the morning were the first day. What did God create on the first day of creation? He created light. Now here's something interesting. And we're going to be focusing on a particular number. That is the number four in the Bible. In your King James Bible, if you look in Genesis chapter 1, um, the Bible says, and God said, let there be light. Light, I believe, is the key to understanding everything. I, and I mean everything. It is the, the first of God's creation when he created the, the expanse of the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void which means no real substance, no form. It was chaotic. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. Four words, and there was light. Four more words. But this idea that light is a multidimensional part of the creation, and there are things about it I understand, things about it I don't understand, but I think light is the key to understanding everything. Light is what the gospel is. The gospel gives us light, and it causes us to be children of the day. If you believe the gospel and are saved, you have this new nature and you have the Spirit of God in you, giving you certain understanding, a certain awareness, even if you don't know some of the deepest, deepest, deepest things of God, you believe the simplicity of the gospel, and you have light enough to see through a lot of the junk and the lies that are going on in this world. So you are a child of the day. You walk in the light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's uh, 1 John uh, 1, 7, I believe. But anyway, so we have... God saying, let there be light, four words, and there was light. What was the source of that light? The source of the light in Genesis chapter 1, before, this is day one, and the heavenly luminaries were not created until day four. Now, that has a significance to it. But what was the source of the light in Genesis chapter 1, on day 1 of creation, there was no sun, there was no moon, there was no stars. Where did the light come from? I think this is real simple. And I think it's simple. And yet when I say it, I think it is so profound and so deep, you'll go, whoa. Are you ready? The source of the light was God's word. Think about it. God said, let there be light. 
By the way, who is that light? That light is Jesus Christ. He is the light of the world. In the time in the future when there is no need for the sun and the moon, it is God who is that light. And so the source of the light on day one of creation was God's word. God spoke it and light goes out into all the universe. Okay? Then God divides the light from the darkness and God saw the light that it was good. And universally, we have this idea that light is good and dark is evil in, in movies. Okay? What color clothes does Darth Vader wear? Black. He's dark. He's evil. What color? It's the dark side of the force. Okay? What color clothes does Luke Skywalker wear? White. He's and Princess Leia. They're they're both wearing white because they represent the good side of the force or the light side of the force. All right? I'm just using that as a as a crude example of how they do it in movies. Okay? Um, but anyway, so think of God's word now. Establishing light in the universe. Then, on day four, and God did this for a reason. Why didn't God create the luminaries on day one or day two or day three? Because God is signifying something here with these heavenly lights. So we have day four. And God said in Genesis 1.14, this is what's up on the screen. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Notice four things. Signs, seasons, days, and years. And all four of these, now here's a neat idea to think about. All of these lights that he created, God said were for signs, seasons, days, and years. All of those terminologies in this context relate to the passage of time. How is it that we measure time? We measure time by the sun, and the motion of the sun, rising up in the east, going down in the west, the evening and the morning being the first day, and when it completes its circuit, there it is rising again, and we say that that is a day. The passage of time from light to darkness to light again is one day. We measure time by the circular motion of that light. Um, sign seasons for days and for years. Uh, the seasons are measured out by way of the transit of the sun, both east to west, that gives us the days, but the transit of the sun going south to north to south again, giving us the summer solstice, the fall equinox, that's when it's over the, crea uh, uh, the equator at noon on, um, let's see, that would be the August or the September equinox, September 21st, on the equator, the sun is straight up at dead noon. Straight up and down, right over it, all right? Then you have the uh, winter solstice, which is what we're nearing now. We call it the shortest day of the year, okay? And the sun is now over the tropic of, I think, Capricorn. And then it starts, it starts rising up again from south to north to south again, and it takes a year to do that, and that's how we measure the years. Because it happens the same way at the same time of the year, and it does it every single year. It's been doing it since the creation. Sign, seasons, days, and years. So this, the years and the seasons and the signs, my dad was a great, great horticulturist. Very good at planting gardens and planting things for us to eat. And, I mean, he just, he just had a knack for it. But he got a farmer's almanac every year. And he went through that almanac, and he figured out what days, according to the, the signs, and we're not talking about astrology, 
where he said, now in Capricorn, I'll do this. And when Aquarius, that when, when, the, when the God Aquarius is going to do this, I'm gonna, that's not what he said. God gave the signs of the seasons for us to use for planting um, those who do animal husbandry. They will often do it according to the signs. My dad always planted according to the signs, according to he would, he would use the almanac to figure out when the last frost was going to be or should be, and he would plant his beans, he would plant his tomatoes, he would plant you know okra or whatever it was he planted, and he always was successful with his garden every year. And farmers of old have been using these for thousands of years, but God gave us those luminaries in the night sky for sign season days and years, for the, for the measurement of the passage of time. And then he said, um, let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So during the day, we have a greater light, which is the sun. We have the lesser light or lesser lights. We have the moon and the stars that govern over the night. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Now, seeing as how God chose that fourth day, then I believe a couple of things about these luminaries. Number one, as I said, they are for the measurement of time. And I believe that time exists or the measurement of time the measurement of linear time exists only in our three-dimensional universe in the world that we live in but outside of our dimension where we have length and width and depth for measurement we don't have anything else i believe outside of that you do not have the measurement of time. I don't think time exists. And to me, this is why I believe God as the Most High can see all of human history all at once. There is nothing about this creation that God made for us. There's nothing about it that is a mystery to God. Whether it has happened, is happening now, or will happen in the future, none of it is outside of God's ability to see it. He sees all of it all at once. That's how come God knows who's going to be saved and who isn't. Okay? So I believe that time is measured by these objects in our dimension, in our world, but outside of our dimension, outside of our world, the measurement of time does it mean anything? It is, a, it is a place that is without time because the Bible refers to, number one, both heaven and hell being real places that these places are in eternity, which means that the passage of time is, I think, unknown it does not follow the rules that you and I are under right now as far as linear time. We, can't, we can only go forward. We can't go back. And I think that time is irrelevant when we get to heaven and or hell. I want you to think about that. For those of you who are not saved, if you are not born again to live in heaven for eternity, then you will live in the lake of fire for eternity and you will know it, and there will be wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth, and this is going to happen in an endless eternity. Man, I want nothing to do with that. So then, this fourth direction, and I, let me just, let me back up here. Let me say this about the stars. There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that those little twinkle, twinkle little stars that we see up in the heavens, 
There's no doubt in my mind that they are more than just objects of gas burning at high temperatures whose light we are able to see because they're so hot because just like the sun and their light is coming through all that distance to us and that's all they are is just these little balls of light goodness gracious great balls of fire okay i there's i have no doubt that they are much more than that what they are are exactly what the bible says they are Go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. You, you, the Bible's going to tell you what they are. Job uh, says it this way. Job calls them the sons of God. And then he calls them the, the, uh, the stars. Uh, where, where was thou when the morning stars sang out? When the sons of God shouted for joy, the morning stars sang out. The Bible's telling you that these sons of God, these stars, are angels. So in Revelation 12, um, you have this uh, John telling us that there is a, he saw this wonder in heaven. In uh, Revelation 12, 3, there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And then later on, it says, in verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was uh, their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And this was the one-third of the stars that were cast out with Satan, he took his tail, grabbed a third of the stars or a third of the angels and cast them down the earth. So, and I, and I believe it literally that in every way, shape, and form, these stars are more than just great balls of fire. They are what we can see of angels, angelic beings that God has set in the heavens, I believe that that is precisely what they are. So, and I think this is important because does the devil really take a third of the stars and make them fall to the earth? Yes. But what are these stars in actuality? They are angels. They are evil angels that fought against Michael to take over, try to take over heaven. Remember, the devil says, "I will, you know, I will set, um, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my uh, seat above the." Uh, I can't even. I got so much in my mind right now. I can't quote uh, Isaiah twelve or fourteen. I've quoted it a billion times. Um, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Above the stars of God. Above the angelic realm. I'm going to rule all the angels. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And so the devil... And his angels are always characterized as stars. I think in Revelation chapter 9, when the fifth trumpet sounds, he sees a star fall from heaven. And this star was given the key of the bottomless pit. This tells us that this star was some sort of intelligent creature. Not just a great big giant ball of fire that fell to the earth that happened to land on a locked gate or a locked door and the key just landed inside of it and it shook and it opened up. I think that this star, I personally think that this star is Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit and he opened the pit, the Bible says. 
So uh, there, there's no doubt in my mind that these stars, doesn't matter if you're looking at, you know, Sirius B or Beetlejuice, which is a real star, or Andromeda, or any of the galaxy clusters, or any of them. I think we are seeing what we can see of angelic beings. Most of them good. A third of them, not so good. So, this fourth direction. And what got me going on this was Ephesians 3. And I remember years ago, I was, I was studying the number three in the Bible. And I was trying to put things together, and I remembered that there was a verse in the Bible that talked about what I thought was going to be the three dimensions. So I looked it up and found the verse, Ephesians 3, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth. And then I saw a fourth one. And it kind of tossed me back a little bit. I was expecting three. But there was more than three. There was four distinct directions. There was breadth, like width, and length. So it goes this way, this way, and depth. It goes this way, and height, which goes this way. Now, we know then, and I'm going to show you some other verses to back this up, that the third heaven, uh, you have the first heaven, which is the atmosphere of the earth. The second heaven is the universe where all the stars are. Then you have the third heaven, which is where the throne of God is. That's what uh, Paul spoke about in 2 Corinthians 12, that he knew someone that was caught up into the third heaven. The third heaven is the realm of God. And I believe, and if you if you're to count locations, you have earth, earth, the first heaven, the second heaven, and the third heaven. The third heaven would be the fourth location from us. And it is in a and, and if you think getting into outer space is hard, try getting into heaven on your own. I mean, the heaven. It is impossible for you to go there and stay there without Jesus Christ. It's impossible. But you have this fourth direction being mentioned in the Bible. And I want you to think about it for a minute. Let's say that um, um, we, we are here. I'm here at Area 52, Festus, Missouri. And you would ask me, where is, where is hell? I would point down. And that, that would be true. Because um, that's what the Bible says. And then you would say, okay, where is heaven? And I would point up. That would be true also. But what if somebody was in China on the other side of the world? And you ask them, where is heaven? They would point up too. But because of the, the roundness of the earth, we would be pointing in two different directions. Because once you get into space, where is up and where is down? Where is it? I mean, it, there's, no, there's no relevance to that. There's no you know, common focus point to be able to say this is up and this is down. And what I'm saying is God has designed it so that height, which is where he is, and I'll show you that from the Bible, height is is a place, not only can we not get there, we can't even point in the direction that it is in reality because we only understand three dimensions. We know that there is a fourth. Scientists, mathematicians, physicists, they know there's a fourth dimension. They can do the calculations and show you, you know, according to the calculations, it all measures out that there is a fourth dimension. And so they, they know about it. 
But because we're limited by our understanding of everything in three dimensions, we have no idea where a fourth dimension would be. It would be like if we were two-dimensional creatures. In other words, our universe consisted of things that were this way and this way, period. And there was no depth. We wouldn't understand depth. We wouldn't understand anything other than this way and this way. So if, you know, if we were told that there was another higher dimension than this way and this way, we would have no concept and no way of understanding what direction that is. But since you and I live in the three-dimensional world, I mean, that's easy for us. There's this way and this way and this way, right? But the Bible's telling you of a fourth direction that right now we can't point and say, that's it. When we get there, we will say, oh, it's right here. How did we not understand that? Okay. We'll know even as we are known, the Bible says. Now watch this. Height. When I saw that, what I did was I do what I tell everybody else to do. Get a King James Bible search software program. And we just happen to have one absolutely free. It's called the Pure Bible Search Software. Go to purebiblesearch.com. Download your free copy for Linux, Windows, Macintosh, absolutely free. No advertisements, no uh, we want your money type of stuff. We are in the business of giving away the word of God free of charge. Donna, a thousand God bless yous to you for God using you to make this amazing software. So you get this software, install it, and type in the word height. Or maybe the word high, because we know that God is what? The most high God. And I think that word also relates to it. But let's look at the word height in the King James Bible. In Job chapter 22, verse 12, is, God, is not God in the height of the heaven? It's in the height of the heaven, people. Isn't that neat? And we know that God is, is there. And then it says, and behold, the height of the stars, how high they are. What, is that, what does that tell you? It tells you what I have been telling you now for the last 30 minutes. I don't think the stars are sitting in and limited to our three-dimensional universe. I don't think they are. I think the stars are exactly in the same dimension that God is in. Because it says, is not God in the height of the heaven and behold the height of the stars, how high they are. By the way, I'm going to add something to why I don't believe in the flat earth theory and its idea that the firmament, according to them, the firmament of the heaven is only like a few, like a few thousand miles over our heads and that, or maybe a few hundred miles, something like that, and that nothing can penetrate it. That's a lousy, a lousy idea of just how high God is beyond that. God and the stars is not sitting a mere few hundred miles above our head. The Bible tells us that, behold, um, he said, my ways, as, as far as the heavens are above the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And I believe that the universe is so outrageously 
Huge. I mean, Hubble telescope looking at light, they say, is coming from 13 billion light years away. And they believe that the universe extends even farther than that. And then beyond the universe, there is a void that we have no idea even how big that void is. And God is in the third heaven beyond that. And by the way, when the Lord comes, we're going to be taken there in a twinkling of an eye. Well, you talk about super fast. Now that's super fast. But that's how high, that's how much higher God is and his thoughts are above our thoughts. So seriously, us trying to comprehend and understand the fourth dimension? Are you kidding me? I mean, I'm trying to give you the best that I can from the Bible, but the truth is, it, it is just beyond me how there could be even a direction that I can't point to. I cannot fathom that. And God says, that's how, that's how much higher I am than you are. Okay, so that's why I believe what I believe about the shape of the universe and the distances that are in the universe. That's why I believe what I believe. Because it makes my God that much higher than all the rest of us. But the, the, the key part of this verse here, I want to get back to this, is that number one, the Bible's telling you where God is. God is in that height. He is in that direction that Paul spoke about, the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. That's the fourth dimension, fourth direction. Is not God in the height of the heaven? He is. He is in that fourth dimension. And the stars, they're also in that same dimension. Behold the height of the stars, how high they are. And so, well, I don't even want to get into that. Look here, Psalm 102, 19. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth. Now, see, he's, he's linked them together. It's not God in the height of the heaven. Here he done the same thing. Uh, for he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth. Psalm 148, 1. Praise you the Lord. Praise you the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. That's where he is. He's in the he's in the a dimension that is so far high above us, we have no idea how to point to it. Proverbs 25, 3, the heaven for height, the earth for depth, the heart of kings is unsearchable. Are, are you seeing that? Heaven for height, the earth for depth, the heart of kings is unsearchable. By the way, earth for depth, think about it. When the, uh, when the star falls and opens a, the pit, he falls to the earth. The entrance to the bottomless pit is in the earth somewhere. And apparently, well, there's no doubt in my mind that this pit somehow, some way, is much deeper than even the depths of the earth because it is a pit that once these creatures are thrown into it, once these devils are thrown into it, they never land. They never hit the bottom. That puts them in a perpetual state of falling. What is the, what is, and these, these devils were put in there thousands of years ago. If you were to be thrown into a pit and be falling now for a, for Five, six thousand years. How far do you think you would fall? And yet, the Bible tells us since this pit is bottomless, that they would just continue to fall. And so the earth, the heaven for height and the earth for depth, those two directions are eternal and have absolutely. Now, this is going to blow your mind a little bit. Not only is heaven in the height, that height never ends. 
It is a never-ending height. Just as the bottomless pit is a never-ending depth. Because it's bottomless. Because once you're in there, you just continue to fall for year after year after year for thousands of years and then on into eternity. You just keep falling and keep falling and keep falling. Now think about it. I'm going to tell you how big God is and how how vast this fourth dimension is. It's huge. It is huge. As I said before, as the bottomless pit is bottomless, so is the height of heaven endless. There is no end to its height. It keeps on going. And yet, God sits at the top of infinity. Woo! God, who is the most high God, sits at the very top of infinity. Infinity means it keeps going and 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 going. And going. It's kind of like your aunt that comes over when they come over and she never shuts up. She just keeps going and 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 and talking about the family history and talking about how it used to be and talking about this and her boils and her and her sicknesses and she just never shuts up. That's how high heaven is. It's higher than that. And yet God sits at the very top, the most high position. God sits at the very top of infinity. I cannot fathom that. It's like this math with, do the math with the angels. The Bible says that we are in an innumerable company of angels, which means the angels are innumerable, meaning that there is, their numbers just keep going and going and going and going. And when you think that you've counted to the utmost angel, you found out that you are just barely scratching the surface and you just keep counting and counting and counting and counting because they are innumerable. And yet, God knows how to take an innumerable number and divide it into thirds. Whoa! Because one third of the angels fall to the earth. And I want you to think about it. What is one third as a as a decimal? It's point three 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 three, and those threes just continue on until your calculator says e on it. But it just continues on and on and on and on. I think it's sort of like pi. No, not like cherry pie or coconut cream pie. Pi three point one four. I think pi is a never-ending decimal, but it's not a repeating decimal. That's just a theory that I have because obviously no one has ever counted out the end of pi, which is a ratio. No one's ever counted it out to the end. Mathematicians and computers have been used to continue to calculate this thing out, but it just keeps it. They've never found the end of it. I don't think they ever will. Because after all, where is the end of a circle? Where is the end? Where do you, how do you take an innumerable company of angels and divide them and take one third of them and cast them down to the earth? Only God can do the math on that. Now, I believe it or not, I was not all that great with math in high school. Waited, waited till I was a senior to take algebra because I didn't think I'd do well in it. There comes turns out that I was programming my Commodore VIC-20 computer in basic programming code. Basic is an uh, anagram. It stands for Beginner's Algebraic Symbolic Construction Code. I was actually doing algebra by writing computer code before I took algebra class. And I take algebra class and I'm going, I know what that is. I can do that. I've been doing that, you know, all this time. So that kind of helped me a little bit. But beyond that, I, I don't remember much from algebra and I'm not good at math. But I understand that God knows how to do math 
so well that he can calculate out one-third of an infinite number and God sits on top of the infinite height. That's how big it is. Now, my point in this is, what is there that God can't do for you? Because if God is smart enough to figure out all of this incredible math, how big is your problem? There isn't anything that God cannot do. Now, check this out. Look at, see, this is, you know, reason 4,812, why I believe the King James Bible and only the King James Bible. It has a language in it you just don't find in these other translations. Look at Matthew chapter 4. Remember the, the story where the devil takes Jesus and he's going to show him all the kingdoms of the world. Now, the flat earth people love this passage because they say it proves a flat earth because if, if there was a globe earth, Satan taking Jesus up to a high place, he can't show him all the kingdoms because he can't see them. You don't understand the Bible. The, and the Bible's going to tell you this. Matthew 4, verse 8. Again, the, take, the devil taketh him up. So we know we're, what direction we're going in. And then it takes him into an exceeding high mountain. Now, what does that phrase mean? Exceeding high mountain. It means that the height of this mountain exceeds high. It exceeds high. It's just like the trumpets in Revel or excuse me, Exodus 19, when God's presence... Uh, was made, was manifest there at, Ma at the top of Mount Sinai. The Bible says that those down at the camp of the Israelites, they heard the trumpets exceeding loud. What does that tell you if you just believe the literalness of the Bible? It means that the trumpets, their sound exceeded what loud was. However you define loud, the trumpets exceeded that. Why? Because these were not three-dimensional earthly trumpets. They were from the higher realm. Therefore, their ability to make a sound and make it loud far exceeds whatever loud is on this earth. I think that there is probably a limit as to how loud something can be in this, in this world. And those trumpets that they heard being exceeding loud, the, the Bible means exactly what it says. They were exceeding what loud is on this earth. And the devil is taking Jesus up into a mountain that exceeds high. This is no earthly mountain. This is a mountain in the spiritual realm or the fourth direction or the fourth dimension. We have another clue to this. In Luke chapter 4, the devil, same story, different wording. The devil taking him up into an high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now, even if the earth was flat and Jesus and the devil are up on this high place so he can show him the whole world, all, he still cannot see them all at once in a moment of time. He has to look around. They're not on a flat earth. They are above this world in a place where they are able to see every kingdom of this world. You know what I think that means? I think it means Pharaoh's kingdom, Sennacherib's kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, the fourth dynasty of China, Obama's kingdom, Saddam Hussein's kingdom, I think it means every kingdom of the world, all the kingdoms of the world, past, present, and future, and he was able to do so in one moment of time. How fast is a moment? It's an, uh, the word moment is undefined. 
He didn't say a minute. He didn't say a second. You know how we say, give me a second. We don't really mean that, do we? We don't mean it's going to take a second. Give me a minute. We don't, we don't mean it's going to take us a minute. We're hoping that it's a short amount of time, but it's never a minute. But the word moment doesn't even have a definition. It could be just the smallest sliver of linear time. And yet, the devil was able to show Jesus being in an exceeding high mountain. All the kingdoms of the world, past, present, and future, in the very slightest moment of time. They must have been in a position higher than our three-dimensional understanding. And, and, and every one of these, we're still dealing with height. We're still dealing with the position of up as, a, as opposed to being down. Now, from the scientific point of view, okay, this theory of the fourth dimension has developed as human knowledge has developed or evolved. August Mobius, 1827, had made the discovery that it would be possible to turn a three-dimensional object into its mirror image by means of a rotation in four-dimensional space. And this is called the Mobius Strip. And he's the one that came up with it. You take a three-dimensional object, turn it into a mirror image by rotating it in four-dimensional space. Now, again, here's this Mobius Strip, and you follow the ant here. The ant walks on top of the strip, but now the ant is walking underneath, and yet the ant then ends up walking back on top again, and it just goes in this constant loop, okay? By the way, this loop here, this number eight, is what this looks like, the number eight. The number eight is the number four, like a new world or a new heaven, a new earth. It's the number for eternity because the number eight Never stops and never starts. It just keeps going and going and going and going and going. But I want you to think about this idea. Rotation in four-dimensional space. It's mirror image. Okay? Did you know that the Bible tells us that the sky that we look into is a mirror? It is. Now I'm gonna, we're going to kind of stretch your mind a little bit. I want you to think about something, okay? When we look into a mirror, it's rather odd if you think about it, what it is that you're looking at. Are you looking at you as you are? Think about it. When you look into a mirror and you raise your right hand. The image in the mirror, what hand is being raised? Not the right hand. The left hand, according to our perspective, right? When you raise your left hand, the object in the mirror does not raise its left hand. It raises its right hand from our perspective. It is a like a weird representation of ourself. We, we sort of have this idea that a mirror image would be our, how, how can I explain it? You would think that since it's your left hand, the mirror image would be your left hand, but it's not your left hand, it's your right hand. Whoever that person is on the other side of that mirror is raising his or her right hand while you're raising your left hand. Now, did you know also, according to Scripture, that when we look into the mirror, it is similar to us looking at Christ. We are beholding, Paul said, as in a glass, beholding our image and this person in the mirror is the exact 
opposite of us. If we are left-handed, that image is right-handed. We are mortal. Jesus on the other side is immortal. We are sinful. The Savior on the other side of that mirror is sinless. We have diseases. That image does not have disease. In other words, we are be, it's, that's the way Paul described it. I don't have the verse in front of me or I'd read it, but Paul's describing this idea of us seeing Christ is just like us looking into the mirror. He is everything that we are not. And this is what Mobius had in his mind. This is what the other scientists thought and the mathematicians that going into the fourth dimension would be like going into and becoming your mirror image. Because when you look in a mirror, if you're in a room, you look in a mirror, it looks like that through that glass is another room in there. And we can see even the depth of, of that other room. I, mean, it's, I know it's weird stuff, but this is science's way and the Bible's way of trying to get us to understand what it is that we're seeing and how we would perceive the fourth dimension. Um, E.A. Abbott, a Victorian schoolmaster and a clergyman who published in 1884 his famous novel called Flatland. Flatland is about two-dimensional creatures called flatlanders who dare to imagine life in a three-dimensional universe called Spaceland and even a four-dimensional world called Thoughtland. And again, I want you to think about it. Two-dimensional creatures only know this way and that way. And yet they believe that there is a dimension beyond themselves and that they dare believe that they could go into that dimension. But in order to do so, they would have to become something higher than themselves. Okay? Now you take that concept and apply it to us. God tells us flesh and blood cannot inherit what? The kingdom of God. Why? three-dimensional creatures we can't live in that fourth dimensional world it's not for us it's not for this flesh body we have to have a new body that is rightly designed by god to be able to live so in first corinthians 15 when we're changed this is why paul gave the illustration of a seed you plant a seed in the ground the seed does not look anything like what it produces. And so when you and I are buried, or we're translated by, by God, our new body is not going to bear much, if any, resemblance to the seed that we put into the ground, or whatever it was that we were when we were translated or raptured into heaven. God's going to give us a body that is equipped to live in this higher dimension. Charles Hinton, in his books, A New Era of Thought, 1888, and The Fourth Dimension, 1904, theorized that the three-dimensionality of space is a necessary condition of man's consciousness. However, it is necessary only to normal awareness. Altered states of consciousness, such as those experienced by mystics and psychics, acquired fourth dimensional perspectives now this is where we're getting into the um the esoteric or the occult nature of it and the drug nature of it those who take lsd remember the door uh aldous huxley telling us that there is a door in our brains, in our consciousness, that stays shut. If we could just open that door, it would open our minds up to a new awareness of a cosmic reality that is beyond this earthly plane that we live in now. 
Um, Huxley said that. Um, Jim Morrison believed it. H. Uh, who else beyond Huxley was there? Oh, uh, Francis Crick. So Francis Crick did what Huxley said do. He took LSD, and he was able to have that door opened, and he got a perspective of things that he never got when he wasn't on LSD. LSD and some of these other drugs like ayahuasca, this uh, mind-altering hallucinogen that you get down in South America, these drugs open up man's consciousness to the spiritual realm, and they're, these people are actually able to see weird, weird stuff that they really cannot explain in three-dimensional language. They can't explain it. That's why when these guys took LSD and they wrote rock and roll songs, when you're not high, you don't get it. When you're tripping and they sing these words, they sing these songs, you're going, oh, I get it. Oh, I get it. Well, what does it mean? It means, yeah, that's what it means. Okay, But they can't explain it in our three-dimensional consciousness. But the idea is that mystics, psychics, people going to meditative states, or people who take these mind-altering drugs, they are opening their minds to a higher dimension and seeing things that our eyes have never seen before. Uh, Hinton is the one that came up with the Tesseract. It's a cube within a cube that when the Tesseract is rotated, the inner cube becomes the outer cube and vice versa. Now, Hoggard explained that. I can't. But, where is it that you heard about a Tesseract? Thor, Captain America, the Avengers movies, they all featured this cube called the Tesseract. And what was it? What was it we found out in the Avengers? What was it we found out in, in uh, Thor? That it was the gateway to a higher universe or a higher dimension this is where thor and loki lived in and that possession of this tesseract this is what uh, i can't remember what this character's name was was an unlimited source of power whoever had the tesseract could rule the world okay then we have charles dodson a.k.a. Lewis Carroll. Charles Dodson was actually a British mathematician who started theorizing on a world inside of a looking glass. He was theorizing on the fourth dimension, what it would look like, how weird it would be, by writing about this little girl named Alice who actually stepped into a mirror. Remember the story, Alice's Adventures Through the Looking Glass. She actually stepped into the mirror, and when she did, she was in another world, in another universe. And Dodson was writing out through this story of Alice what he thought it would be like in this higher dimension, the fourth dimension, which he called going through the looking glass. Then we have, that led to H.G. Wells, who wrote The Time Machine, theorizing that the man who traveled through time did so by taking this little ship that operated throughout the fourth dimension so that he was able to both travel backward and forward through time. That led to Russian mathematician Herman Minkowski, who first coined the phrase four-dimensional space-time continuum, which basically means that if you could get into the fourth dimension, you could, in theory, travel through time. And that led to Albert Einstein and the first ideas concerning quantum physics 
the idea that there are subatomic particles that must operate and exist both in our reality and in another dimension because these these uh, subatomic particles these quantum particles do not follow the order or the rules of physics that things above them like atoms and molecules and you and I and our cars and everything else these subatomic particles these quantum particles don't follow the same rules of physics that you and I do you and I cannot be in two places at once and yet by way of quantum tunneling an object can be in two places at the same moment in time or an object can travel from one place to another place without occupying any of the space between those two places I mean that's one of the laws of physics I mean that's math and everything else but in the quantum world those rules don't apply so it leads these people to believe that subatomic particles exist in other words the things that we're made of exist in two places or two different states one the physical world that you and I are part of and also our atoms exist the subatomic parts of our atoms exist in a higher dimension or they called it an alternative universe an alternate universe okay I don't think that they're wrong I don't think that they're wrong on this now here's the basic ideas of the fourth dimension a fourth spatial direction that we cannot currently perceive or point to in our three-dimensional space that's number one number two a fourth dimensional object is not bound by three-dimensional space think about it um, if I were to project on the wall from a projector a brick wall could my hand go through the area on in two-dimensional space that this brick wall exists in yes a two-dimensional brick wall does not restrain my hand from moving through it my hand can go through it like it was nothing my hand in a three-dimensional world is not affected by anything in the two-dimensional world again it's like projecting a picture on a wall with a projector movie projector you know computer projector whatever that's a two-dimensional object is what's projected on the wall it exists in two dimensions only all right my hand running across the surface of that two-dimensional brick wall is not affected by it in any way shape or form now there's a story in the Bible that portrays that uh, number three upon entering the fourth dimension you become your opposite or your mirror image that also is biblical number four the barrier between dimensions is likened to a mirror or a water surface that also is in the Bible number five a fourth dimensional object casts a three dimensional shadow we covered that the other day we're going to talk about it again first Mark chapter 16 verse 19 so then after the Lord had spoken unto them he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God what direction did he go in up he went into the height of the heavens Acts chapter 1 verse 9 and when he had spoken these things while they beheld he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight he was taken where to the height of the heaven second Kings 2 11 it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven I mean it's described as up 
but we can't really beyond once it gets once Jesus as he's going up once he leaves the atmosphere of the earth what direction is he going he's going to the height okay uh then then we have this other look at this I like this Rule number two is a fourth-dimensional object is not bound by three-dimensional space. A three-dimensional space has no effect upon a fourth-dimensional object. The same way my three-dimensional hand does not is not affected by a two-dimensional wall. I can go right through it if I want to. So, Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, you have the Bible giving you a clue here by using the number 4. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Woo! And remember what was said after that, that when Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Jesus, four, in the fiery furnace, not only were they not affected by the flames of the fire, not only were they not hurt by that, but when they were, uh, when when they came out, Nebuchadnezzar goes by them and he's sniffing them, and he's going, "You guys don't even smell like smoke. Your clothes aren't burnt. They're not singed. Your hair's not steaming. You're not even sweating. You don't even smell like smoke. Why? Because I believe the fourth." the Son of God, held them in fourth-dimensional space. That's just you know my little theory here. But he held them in fourth-dimensional space so that three-dimensional fire, no matter how hot it was, had no effect on them whatsoever. It's, it would be like, okay, the gas station I stop at, they are selling videos, a DVD. Get this now. For $9.95, I can buy a DVD of a lit fireplace. Not kidding you. So that I can play that on my big screen TV for Thanksgiving or Christmas. And it would be just like us sitting around the fire as a family reading the scriptures on the you know on the on the lord's day there talking about the lord jesus christ being born as a as a baby boy in bethlehem which is what we do and we have a lit fireplace actually we don't we only have a two di dimensional representation of a lit fireplace right all we have is a two di a two dimensional fireplace if my hand were to touch it it would not be burnt it does not heat up our house any. We cannot. We shouldn't tell our children now. Don't sit too close to the fire now, because you know it might get burnt. They're not going to get burnt. We know it, right? Same principle. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and the Son of God in a like a fourth dimensional bubble, and because they're in a higher dimension, they're not being touched or affected in any way by that fiery furnace. Okay. Look at this. In Mark 16, 12, after that he appeared in another form un unto two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it unto the residue, and neither believed they them. So in verse 30, and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. How did Jesus do that? He was able to, in the form that he was, he was able to travel from one place to another place without occupying any of the space between those two spaces, just like a quantum particle does with quantum tunneling, or just like any creature can... Tr okay, think about it. I have... Um, I have a picture of a countryside on my computer screen. My computer screen and the image of that of the countryside is two-dimensional. I can put my finger on 
one part of that picture and there is a point of contact with my finger into that two-dimensional world, I can then pull my finger away from the two-dimensional image and put it on another part of the picture, let's say the next hill over in this image that I have, and I've basically done what quantum particles do and what Jesus did in this story. I've moved from two places in a two-dimensional universe without my finger having to pass through any of the two-dimensional space between it. In other words, I used the third dimension to travel from one space to another in the two-dimensional world. Okay? The same thing applies if we go up one dimension. Christ is sitting there with these men. Next thing you know, he disappeared, and he finds himself in another place. Philip was the same way. Philip was, um, do I have that up here? No. When Philip was baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, the Bible says that he was caught away from that place and he ended up at Azotus without occupying any of the space between where the water was and Azotus. Philip just shows up there. And, and the Bible uses the term caught away. I love this because you and I, in the moment that we are transformed into our spiritual bodies, our celestial bodies, we will be able to travel from earth to meet Jesus in the heights of the clouds instantaneously without, I believe, without occupying any of the air between here and Jesus. And then we get to go to be with Jesus in heaven just Boom, just from here to there, just like that. Watch this. Here's another story I like, and the number four is in this. Matthew 14, 25. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Wow. Now, if you had a picture of the sea, on your computer screen could you put your finger on the top of the water and make your finger move across the top of the water well of course you would would your finger get wet no because your finger is in a three-dimensional world and your finger is walking across the top of the water that exists only in a two-dimensional world of course you can do that it's easy for you. You think nothing of it. And here's Jesus, and here's that number four, the fourth watch of the night. See, the Bible's giving you this clue here. He's walking on the sea. How? His body, for all intents and purposes, has the ability to walk across water, being in the fourth dimension or the spiritual world and walking on the surface of the water is as easy to him as it is for us to move our finger across the top of water on our computer screen it's the same thing okay it's as easy for him to do that as it is for us to do that on a computer screen it's nothing okay the mirror i like this 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know a part, but then shall I know, even as I also I as, as I am known. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. He's talking about a looking glass. And are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we're told then that if we were to look in a mirror, we're beholding in that glass the glory of the Lord. How so? The glory of the Lord is the exact opposite of everything that we are. And yet one of these days, we are going to be changed into that image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So when we are transformed into our celestial bodies, our spirit bodies, I believe that we're going to pass through 
a looking glass. The Bible says so. Now, it does not say the words, we're going to pass through the looking glass. It doesn't say that. But it tells us here, it gives us this idea that we are going to be changed from this image in this world to the image in in the other side of the looking glass and we're and that's going to be done by the spirit of the lord and then there's something else job 37 18 hast thou with him spread out the sky which is strong and as a molten looking glass take a look at that I haven't been talking conspiracy much, so I haven't pushed that button. And when I push that button, that gives me time to drink coffee. And so I haven't drank much. I'm really thirsty. Now, every flat earth video that talks about the dome over the earth that's impenetrable, they always use a portion of Job 37, 18. They say this, the God spread out the sky and it's strong and it's a looking glass and you can't penetrate through that glass. Well, that's not what it says. It says it's as a molten looking glass, which means it's liquid, not solid. You can pass through it. In fact, not only is it as a molten looking glass, it is a sea of glass, an ocean, I guess, of liquid glass. Okay? Ezekiel 1 5, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Remember, and, and we have this number four here telling us what's going on here. So in Ezekiel 1.22, in the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. So there is a firmament over their heads. And that firmament is, in Revelation 4, a sea of glass like unto crystal. Now that's what Ezekiel was seeing. The color of the terrible crystal, and it's the firmament. And in this case, in Revelation 4, Revelation 4, we find that it's a sea of glass like unto crystal. Now, let me, let me kind of explain the word firmament. Because flat earth people say, That's, see, it's a firmament. Can't get through it. In, in uh, Genesis, let me read this. In Genesis chapter 1. I know I'm talking deep, deep stuff here. And if you are barely understanding it, then you understand it pretty much the way I do. Barely. Let me read Genesis chapter 1 when God made that firmament. Genesis chapter 1 verse 6, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. God made the firmament, divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, we know that clouds are in the heaven. We know that clouds are water. And we know that clouds are held up by a firmament. And I want you to think about it. In a cloud, let's say you have a cloud the size of your county. There's, there's big clouds like that. How many tons of water do you think is in that cloud? Probably hundreds. Water is heavy. And usually when you look up, you see the bottoms of those clouds the bottoms of those clouds are relatively flat as if they literally were sitting on a solid object, aren't they? So what is it in reality 
that's holding those clouds up. It's air pressure, pure and simple. It is a difference in air pressure, and there is enough, and air can be really dense. There is enough air pressure that is pressing on the bottom of that big, heavy, thick cloud holding up hundreds of tons of water. And it's sitting, and its bottom is nearly flattened out because it's sitting on what the Bible calls a firmament. A firmament of air that is so firm, it is able to hold up tons of water. Now, can that firmament be passed through? Sure. Airplanes do it all the time. They pass through that firmament. They go from here to there through the clouds, and it's nothing to them. And yet that firmament is so firm, it holds up hundreds, maybe even thousands of tons of water. So just because the Bible uses the word firmament, that does not mean it's steel hard and nothing can penetrate it. That is not true. Even the firmament, this is what we were looking at with Ezekiel chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 4. Even the firmament that was on top of the, the four cherubs' head, which held the throne of God, that firmament itself was like a molten-looking glass, and the Bible describes it as a sea of glass, clear as crystal, or it must have been liquid glass, strong enough to hold the very throne of God and be called a firmament and ride upon the head of those four cherubs, just like the clouds sit on top of a firmament in the air. And that firmament is so tough that it flattens out the bottoms of those clouds. See, people, when you just think about it, it makes sense. Now, let's go back to um, the book of Daniel, and let's get a little bit more of this before we close out today. Daniel 7, verse 2, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. What happens when the wind blows on the sea? Stirs up the waves, right? And four great beasts came up from the sea. Notice the number four here. Four winds, four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. What kind of sea was this? The typical ocean waters that we see? Or is there a fourth dimensional water firmament that separates our dimension from a fourth dimension where these beasts are and these beasts were able to rise up from this sea? I think that's what the Bible's talking about. 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Now take a look at all this. These are called scrying tools. What happens, and this is all occult practice, this is divination is what it is. You remember Snow White and the Seven Dwarves? Remember the, the, who was it that said mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? That lady talking to that mirror was scrying. She was using a reflective device. And the image that she saw on the other side of that mirror was a familiar spirit. When people use scrying tools whether it's a crystal ball or a mirror do you remember those of you who read the lord of the rings do you remember the elves 
had what was called the Mirror of Galadriel, and they used it for divination. And supposedly, Lord of the Rings is supposed to be this great Christian book. Mm. I don't think so. They were scrying. They were practicing divination, getting in contact with familiar spirits. But the idea is, is that this mirror is the separation between our world and the spiritual world. And one of the ways that witches um, or any kind of a divination practitioner, witches do use scrying tools, that the way to get in contact with any spirit would basically be to go to the portal that they're going to be at, which is either a bowl of mercury or a bowl of water or a um, a crystal ball or to go to a a like a clear river where you could look down and see an image down in there. A lot of witches will use riverways in places like, especially where the water's clear, where they get a reflection. Because as they gaze into that, they are looking into the world underneath them. Remember where the witch at Endor she was to use divination and to get in contact with familiar spirits. When she saw these spirits, where were they coming from? They were coming up from the earth. They were in a dimension lower than them. Okay? In hell. And they, they, were, they were gods that were coming up out of the earth. And this one was pretending to be Samuel. But she was using some sort of divination, maybe even scrying. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say, so it's not a big deal. The reflection pool. Here's the one in front of the Museum in Paris, France. And you get this, you get this image of a pyramid. And notice that you have a pyramid now pointing up and one pointing down. That is, these reflecting pools have this idea of as above, so below on it. But it's the idea that a reflecting pool is a way to peer into the other dimension. Did you see the matrix? When Neo takes the, what was it, the red pill? can't remember. They strap him down to this chair. They're going to try to locate his body. And he's sitting next to a, a big mirror. What does he do? He puts his fingers into the mirror, and all of a sudden he finds out that the mirror is not solid. It's in a liquid state, and he ends up basically falling through that mirror. That's how he leaves the matrix realm and enters into the realm that they all call Zion. Wachowski brothers, which are both now the Wachowski sisters. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. Both Wachowski brothers that made the Matrix movies have turned themselves into women, have transgendered themselves. I lie not to you. Bunch of sodomites. But basically, it's the same thing. The sky above us is as a molten looking glass. And when you and I are translated, we're going to go through that that firmament, that sea of glass. Going through that, we're going to be transformed from this world to the higher world. Isn't it, isn't it cool? Okay, the, the Bible, the Bible is an absolute perfect blueprint of everything about this universe and the other world, the higher world. And the Bible tells you of a dimension that is so far above our knowledge that we can't even fathom it. And yet the Bible is telling you the simplicity of it. And all of these Things that were seen in the Bible about mirrors and rivers and a sea and ocean. How did the how did the Israelites 
get from the land of bondage to the land of promise. They had to pass through the sea, didn't they? And God made a way for them. And that sea, or whether it's the sea, the Red Sea, or the River Jordan, or whatever, it doesn't matter. God is showing you that between us and heaven, there's like this sea of glass, this firmament. We must pass through it, just like us passing through the mirror. And when we do, we're going to be everything that we're not right now. We're going to be our mirror image, perfect in every way, with a new body, mm. in a new world where time is no longer. It's deep stuff here. Now, uh, probably Thursday, we'll get into the quantum aspect of this. Quantum computers connecting to the next dimension by way of technology. Okay? That's what's coming to this world. Get ready for it. All right? I love you. God bless you. Thank you for your prayers for us and your support. Keep it up. You're the reason why we do what we do. We'll see you next time. Remember, think Bible.